weekend and and not only in your your giving and offerings but you know things like most people don't realize the cost of conferences when you have plane tickets and hotel rooms and meals and so just thank you for your faithfulness in giving and you guys have and uh for a small church you guys have a reputation for generosity and and so a lot of our guest speakers are just very thankful and overwhelmed by the by God's goodness. Amen. So I just want to commend you. And it's a good reputation when you're known for generosity. Is that a good thing? It's really good. So thank you in your giving and your faithfulness. Now at this time we're going to uh, dismiss kids to go to Children's Church. And uh, uh, thankful for our Children's Church workers and for everything that God is doing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And let's just make a shift to the next portion of the service and um, Jamie just Jamie preached a big sermon in two or three minutes <laughs> that was really big so we thank you guys for being with us today so um, I, I was extremely touched uh, last weekend obviously and I know as a body and all of our guests that we had in and it was really fun having people from literally all over the United States come in for this conference and that's a a really powerful thing and I think we're gonna see that more and more uh, I think that's one of the reasons uh, that we have hotels growing up like crazy in Ardmore Oklahoma I think that is a prophetic sign of the awakening that's coming and some of the things that we've seen prophetically even with the dreams I had in the nation of Japan uh, that's not my sermon today but I've seen uh, this becoming a major hub of awakening and revival this whole region and so um, a lot of people are like, wow, why are we getting so many hotels? Well, we need them. But again, it's something prophetic that the Lord's doing. Amen. And uh, so I just, uh, I want to talk a little bit this morning, and I'll, I'll interweave, you know, and I, the, the title of my message is The Power of His Presence. Amen. And we've always purposed to be a house of His presence. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not a house of His Word or a house of healing or a prophetic house or any of those things, but I want to give some language to what happens when God manifests His presence. Amen. And, uh, you know, one of the words that Charlie gave, and I've, I've tried to re-watch this week some of those prophetic words that were given to us as a body, to me personally, to the Supernatural School. Uh, one of the words that he gave, and I believe it was Sunday morning, was that over the next year there would be three waves of his presence that hit us right and each successive wave will be stronger than the previous wave right so can we believe for that yes. yeah so we that means we prepare ourselves though sometimes i don't know how you can totally prepare for a wave because <laughs> sometimes it'll knock you down and sweep you off your feet right and I would rather have now some of y'all were crazy last weekend <laughs> some of y'all are real crazy this morning I don't know but you know what I'd rather have the craziness and the mess of the nursery than the quiet solitude of the cemetery right and uh, so I want to talk this morning about the power of his presence and I, I want to start I'm just going to read this to you, and as I read this to you, just listen and put away your religious baggage. Because sometimes we read some of these accounts and we're just like, well, that's in the Bible and that doesn't apply to me. You do. You do that. We all do that because we think, well, that was that Bible character and what he experienced. But put yourself in the place of this person as I read, and I'm not even going to tell you where it is. I'm just going to start reading. So, and on the 24th day of the first month, while I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. His body also was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. Now I alone saw the vision 
While the men who were there with me did not see the vision, nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color to him turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Now, if y'all fall asleep today, don't say it's because you had a vision, okay? <laughs> you might. So this was Daniel, and he's out walking along the river with a group of people, and he gets caught up in a heavenly vision. And even though the other people with him didn't see it, they sensed the presence of God fall on them. And they ran. And Daniel stayed in this place, and he literally said, he fell on his face like someone who was asleep or in a trance or dead. Now, we read that and we're like, well, that's Daniel. But do you realize that when God manifests his presence... Crazy things happen. Now, I'm not writing a theology this morning. But when God manifests who He is, we get touched by that. Right? It's like we get, no, not all the time. Okay? I mean, Chris Valentin has said he's, and this was several years ago, and I don't think it's changed. He said, I've never fallen out under the power. Okay, falling out or under the power or not falling out under the power doesn't make you more spiritual than anyone else. Okay, if you fall out under the power, get up and be changed. Right, but there are certain things that often happen when God manifests His presence. And if you read the Bible and you see what happens when God manifests His presence, you're just like, holy moly. Look what God does. What we've experienced last weekend wasn't really that weird. Now, some of y'all were still weird. <laughs> Not naming any names, right? <laughs> Trying to avoid eye contact. <laughs> but let's talk about this, you know, because when, <laughs> yum, yum. Boy, that was weird, wasn't it? But I loved it. Yum, yum. <laughs> so James has a new nickname, right? <laughs> yum, yum. <laughs> but, you know, we read a story like this, and it, it kind of, if this happened today, people would say, oh, I'm so uncomfortable with that person just happened. If an angel showed out, up in our service today, and they are here, yeah. right, and we fell out, some people would be uncomfortable, not based on their experience, but based on their lack of experience. <laughs> Right? And stuff like this really happens, and we often judge based on our lack of experience. But the Bible teaches that God manifests Himself tangibly to people. Right? And why wouldn't God want to do that? Because He's in a covenant relationship with you and me. He's basically in a marriage relationship with you and me. And I don't know about you, but when I got married, I didn't want just a mental relationship. Y'all are looking so holy. <laughs> but, right, would it, what kind of relationship would it be if you didn't experience one another and you didn't have intimacy and interact with one another, right? But God wants to interact with us. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to experience Him. And as wonderful as the Word of God is, and as much as we need the Word of God, and it's the foundation of everything we do, He wants us to know Him, hear His voice, and walk in obedience to what He says. Because yeah. Jesus didn't just say, Jesus said, you know, don't pray, just say pray a prayer and you're good. You know what He said? He said, follow me. If we're not following Him, we probably don't know Him. And part of that comes when we experience Him, know who He is. He manifests His presence, and we're touched and changed. Yeah. And anytime you study revival and revival history, 
It's always about God manifesting His presence and His glory in a corporate way that changes not only churches, but changes entire cities, nations, and societies. England was changed because of the Great Awakening, right? Many people feel that if France had responded the same way that England did, they would have avoid, avoided some of the things that they went into. Wow. Whereas England was totally changed and things like slavery were done away with because of revival and awakening. Yeah. Wow. Right? And that all starts when God begins to manifest His presence because people are hungry for Him and what He's doing. Amen? So I want to talk, and this is a foundational understanding that many of us have, we've talked about over the years, but I just want to say it again. There are levels of the presence of God. You know, and sometimes we get, we, we wrangle over theology over some of these things, and we're like, well, we can't pray for God to come because He's already here. And some of the people who say that are the deadest people I've ever seen. Now, there is a level of omnipresence, which means God is everywhere, right? In Psalm 139, the psalmist was like, where can I flee from your presence? No matter where I go, you're there. I mean, we teach little kids that, don't we? Well, if you misbehave, I may not be here, but God's watching you and he knows, right? Great fear tool, right? <laughs> but that's a level of, that's the omnipresence of God. Then there's the indwelling presence of God. When we become born again, we become a habitation of the Spirit of God. Right, Our spirit that was dead becomes joined to the Holy Spirit and comes alive, and we're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome that the Holy Spirit dwells in you when you become born again? And we join together, and we all have the Spirit of God, and we're all these living stones that are being formed together. We're in process becoming the temple of the Lord. Right, But then there's, there's a manifest presence of God where God manifests in such a way that our senses become aware that He's here. Yeah. Right? I'll talk about that more in just a minute. And then there's another level that we're really not talking about today where His Shekinah glory begins to manifest. And it's not just a visitation, but the Shekinah glory actually has to do with God dwelling in a place and not leaving. And that's what happens when we, when we make His presence a priority and we begin to host Him and He comes and He stays. Now, He's here, right? He's omnipresent. But what happens when His Shekinah glory begins to set in a region? You know, I've heard accounts of places where revival is breaking out and people are walking by in the this, this street where right. gatherings are happening and they don't even know what's going on there and they're falling out under the power. Yeah. Right. What was that? Right? Or buses go by and people fall out on the bus. Mm -hmm. Or when one of the awakenings was happening in North America, in America, and this is documented, and sailors would get within so many five miles of the shore, and no one preaching to them, because of the manifest Shekinah glory, they would fall on their knees and begin to repent without anybody even preaching to them. That's what happens when the Shekinah begins to manifest, the dwelling presence. And so, you know, we're going to talk about this morning about what happens when His presence shows up. Now, sadly, there, and I don't want to be one of these churches where we can preach the Word, we can study the Word, but there's no presence. Yes. Yeah. Right. I, I don't ever want that. I want us to be a place of His presence, a place of His glory. Amen? And I think He wants that for His people. Yeah. He's hungry for that. Amen? Now, when I talk about the manifest presence of God, and I'm, I don't I know they understand these things very well, but we are being bombarded by all kinds of waves and light and energy right now. True? Right. I mean, even radio waves, they're going through our body. They're going through, you know, certain machines. But what happens when in a radio there's a certain device in a certain setting and that wave hits us hits the radio, and suddenly a music comes out. There's a sound that's produced. Well, that's kind of like the manifest presence of God. 
he's present, but then there becomes those moments when we've got our setting on. <laughs> and isn't it strange that you can be in a meeting and someone be totally touched by the presence and the glory of God and the person next to them be completely unaffected? Now, sometimes God just sovereignly does stuff, but usually it's when we've got our antenna on and the setting on that we get impacted by the manifest presence of God. Right. Then you have those moments sometimes where God just says, I don't care, you're resisting me, and I'm going to do it anyway. It's what he did to Saul. Saul was going to kill Christians, and God just showed up, blinded him, knocked him off his horse. He said, you got a lot of pride, I'll show you. Right? Or you guys have heard me talk about Cal Pierce, the guy who started the healing rooms. Now, if he didn't start them, um, who's the dude that started them? John G. Lake. And then, and then Cal Pierce took him up later. And Cal Pierce is an elder at Bethel. And Bill Johnson comes to pastor. And he doesn't like Bill. And he's like, I'm at retirement age. I'm out of here. I'm not going to have anything to do with this. This revival stuff is freaking me out. Goes to a leaders meeting, and he's like, okay, this is probably going to be a two or three hour meeting. Worship team's going to go this long. I'll be out of here in three hours, and I'm retiring soon. Well, God had a different idea, and he crashed in on Cal Pierce, and he basically came out of it hours later. And Bill Johnson said it was one of the most holy things he've ever, he's ever seen. He said, I watched God clothe himself with this man, and he shook and trembled under the power of God for three hours. And when Cal came out of it, he was completely different. And he was consumed by presence of God and consumed with a desire for revival. Sometimes God's just like, I'm going to do it anyway. But generally, God does it when we're like, okay, I'm, I'm putting my antenna up. I'm putting my setting on because, God, I want you to manifest your presence and your glory. Amen. And so here's some examples. We're just going to go through this really fast, but, you know, we just read about Daniel. That was Daniel. I may have not said that, right? But I said it. Okay, thank you. It's good to have someone with me. Somebody's with me. I, I need help. The, but Daniel had this feeling of weakness, falling to the ground, shaking, and trembling. Is that crazy? So did any of you last weekend, you don't have to raise your hand, Anybody fall to the ground last weekend, shake or tremble? Yeah, some of you did, right? I did. You know, we talk, we laugh about this, but the Quakers, why were they called Quakers? Right now we just think of them as a guy who has oats. <laughs> they were called Quakers because they quaked in the presence of God. Wow. That's how they got their name. You know what they would do? They would literally gather in a meeting... And no one spoke until the Spirit of God would begin to move on them. This is revival history. And as they'd wait. They'd wait on God to move. Now, that's not necessarily the model that I think is the best. But it's what they did. And God manifested His glory and His presence in their midst. Right? Now, what about... Um, I'm just going to give you some scripture verses here. We'll, some we'll read, some we won't. But Exodus 20, verses 18 through 20 literally talks about God coming on the mountain and the people quaked and trembled in the presence of God. They literally shook in the presence of God. Right? Sometimes we sing those things and we don't think about it or we read those things. Do you understand that this really happened? They really shook in the manifest presence of the glory of God. Now, there might have been a little fear in that too. Right? I don't know. Right? I mean, it's in revival accounts that, you know, people would get in the presence of God in meetings and some of the, 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 the revivals and the Cumberland Ridge and all those things. And ladies would have their hair up in buns and they would begin to shake and headbang yeah. until their hair would come out of the bun and it would crack like a whip because they shook so hard. Those were the original headbangers. <laughs> Y'all, that's in revival history. And it was people like Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians. That's, Methodists were known as shouting Methodists. They were the Pentecostals of their day. 
Right? Now, there are some crazy Methodists here in town. I know some of them. They're hungry. Yeah. Right? But God, people would quake and tremble. And sometimes the presence of God would come on them in meetings and they would run until the glory would lift off. Sometimes that's the only way they could get it off was by running under the Spirit of God. Right? Be careful. Right? God manifests His presence. Crazy things happen. Right? 1 Samuel 19. Here's another one. Verses 18 through 24. They send soldiers after David, and as they come to apprehend him, Saul does this, and they begin to prophesy, and they couldn't stop. And so Saul's finally like, well, I'm going after him myself. And he went after him, and it says, for a day and a night, he lay naked prophesying on the ground because the Spirit of God came on him. That's where we got the drop cloth because we don't want nobody <laughs> naked and prophesying. We got to draw the line there. <laughs> but you know what? I've seen that happen. They had clothes on. But we saw that happen in our school years ago and this move break out. And, you know, you guys have heard me talk about the story where this boy came in and just got whacked on a Wednesday night service. And he crawled around for like an hour prophesying. 15-year-old boy. It's one of the most holy things I've ever seen. Do you know that's scriptural? It scared me. Because he was prophesying to me things that, I mean, it, it was right, but it was scary to hear it coming out of his mouth. There was no manipulation in that. Another one here, Jeremiah 23, 9. It talks about Jeremiah's bones trembled in the presence of God. And it said, he was like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine. Anybody ever been touched by the presence and you were like a drunken man or a drunken woman? You guys, you don't need to go to a bar or a dance hall. Just get in a place where there's the manifest presence of God and the only hangover you have is a glory hangover. You can have a Holy Ghost party. Right? And there's nothing like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Wait, okay. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I forget sometimes I'm a 52-year-old man, and my kids are like, stop, and my wife is like, stop, right? <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 1, right? And y'all, this is all Old Testament. This is before it get, gets crazy, right? Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, you know, Ezekiel, Ezekiel. Ezekiel experiences this heavenly encounter. He's caught up. This angel grabs him by the head and yanks him into an encounter. But when the angel appears, he falls on his face like a dead man. This is Bible. Right? I'm not saying that this has to happen again. I'm not saying, I'm not forcing anything. I'm saying... When we see unusual things happen in the glory of God, because here we are, physical beings, and it's like we get plugged into a power source that we're not entirely ready for. Yes. Yes. And we're like, whoa, that's the glory of God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and somebody may be laying on the floor trembling and crying, and somebody else may be laughing, yeah. Yeah. right? And somebody else may be just quiet. But they're expressions of what God does, and they're very scriptural, yeah. right? Here's another one, famous one that uh, all of us Baptocostals, right, and Pentecostals and Charismatics love. Acts chapter two, Holy Spirit gets poured out. Everybody's like, "Are they drunk?" Right? And I've talked about this before, but why did they think they were drunk? Because they were speaking in tongues? Because they spoke in tongues. No, they thought they were drunk because they acted drunk. Anybody ever traveled to another country where they speak another language? 
Many of us have been in an international airport. You never think when you hear people speaking another language, well, they must be drunk. <laughs> no, you think people are drunk when they're staggering and laughing and, you know, they thought they were drunk. There was a manifestation of the presence and the glory of God. Here's another one. Revelation 1, 9 through 17. John this heavenly being appears to him and says, Come up here, I have things to show you. And it says, He fell at the feet of this heavenly being as though he were a dead man. The Word is full of this stuff, you know? And so I just want to give us a little bit of a, of a foundation that this is scriptural, okay? Now, again, it doesn't make, you don't have to do this. And I've done things in the presence of God that later that I'm like, whoa, look what I did. I couldn't have done that, you know. We are watching one of the videos from Charlie, and I'm like, Jamie, you've got to come watch yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You're sitting here on the front row, and she goes, oh, I don't want to see that. <laughs> I was like, Emily, come watch this. And she's like, I know, I sat behind her. We live the freak show, right? <laughs> but one of the words was that she would prophesy like Stacy Campbell. Yeah. That same anointing, that ecstatic prophecy. I don't understand that. And again, y'all, I'm not trying to make a doctrine of these things. I'm just trying to say we've been so living in dead Christianity so long in religion that we don't know what to do when God begins to manifest His presence, and it scares us, right? And it's not about the manifestation, but it's about the presence of God that's coming to touch us and set us free. Yeah. One of my favorite stories about the Toronto outpouring and the awakening in the 90s was the teenage girl with dyslexia who falls out and while she falls out, she sees angels come. <laughs> this is such a crazy story. And unscrew the top of her head. And operate on her brain. And when she comes out of it, she doesn't have dyslexia anymore. And her parents are both doctors. And they, they have her tested and, you know, and... Even funnier than that, and if I'm getting the story right, she has another friend who has the same condition that she starts telling what happened to her, and her friend falls out and has the same experience. Because sometime in the manifestation, it's manifesting because God's doing something in us, spirit, soul, and body, that's causing transformation. This isn't just old stories. This isn't just from the 90s. I mean, a few years ago, we heard Heidi talking about, you know, being preaching the gospel, you know, this woman that people call a witch because <laughs> she sees miracles. She has a degree in systematic theology, a doctorate, right? And, you know, here they are preaching the gospel, risking their lives while people criticize them bravely from their parents' basement typing on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> You know, the government's got a hit out on her. They're preaching, and the witch doctors come to mock and curse them. The power of God knocks them all on the ground. And Heidi and Roland and their team are like, y'all, y'all need to get saved. I think that's a good incentive to get born again. But there's a manifest presence of God, and may it come to America. May He manifest His glory and even the fear of the Lord. We, we've, we've, we've had this pendulum where we've swung so far encountering God as, a, as Father and as a loving God, and He is. But sometimes the fear of the Lord just needs to crash in and awaken some people out of their sin and bondage 
and bring them out of bondage into the glory of his presence and his light and of the gospel. Right? May God restore that. I mean, Charlie, that's one of the things he prophesied. He saw a couple of years ago. He said, I saw the state of Oklahoma. It looked like a hand. And he said, I saw the Lord take a hold of that hand with his hand and the state begin to shake. And he saw earthquakes coming to Oklahoma, right? And he said, the Lord showed me that Oklahoma would be a forerunner in the fear of the Lord returning to our nation. Amen. Right? I mean, our, our, one of our spiritual fathers, Dr. Sam Matthews, prophesied that in the early 80s, and everybody thought he was crazy. He said, I see earthquakes coming to Oklahoma. And he went out and bought earthquake insurance for like $2, and his agent laughed at him and said, you don't need this. Well, they finally canceled his policy a few years ago because of the earthquake damage he kept getting in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Because there's something of the fear of God and the glory of God coming upon this city, our state, and our nation in a new way. And it has to come because I don't know about you, some of the things I've seen in the news over the last 24 to 36 hours are some of the most frightening things I've ever seen. Suicide my rear end. But we've got to get ready for some of this mass exposure that's coming. And, and nobody's safe, Republican or Democrat. But we have to be prepared. And the fear of the Lord is coming to our nation. Y'all, if y'all don't know what I'm talking about, watch the news. I'm sure you've seen it. You know, you can't avoid it. And I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying God's doing something. Amen. Hallelujah. Back to the manifestation of His presence. Now, you know, why does the Holy Spirit manifest His presence? He often does that to give revelation and direction, right? And He often manifests His presence to empower people for service, right? He often comes to bring physical or emotional healing, right? I, I love it when people start getting healed just being in the presence of God. I have expectation today as we get ready for communion, that when we're doing communion, that God just heals people. Because of His presence. He's been doing that. But I, I just, you know what happens? When, when we become familiar with the presence of God, He shows up because we expect Him to show up. We have a paradigm for Him to show up. We have an expectation and a faith level that He's going to show up and we're going to experience His presence. And we're going to ask Him to show up. Yeah. Right? But He brings healing, physical and emotional. He gives revelations. Right? Sometimes visions. We read some very scriptural visions here. The Bible is full of visions. They're just not new agey. Right. Prophecy. Words of knowledge. A lot of people experience words of knowledge by something that they feel in their body. Right? That's one of the ways Randy Clark experiences words of knowledge the most. He shows up to empower people for service. Amen. You'll be witnesses. Isn't that what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming? So we can have a goose bump or roll around in the floor in a meeting? Those are byproducts, but the real purpose is that we're being empowered to be witnesses of the gospel. Who needs to be a witness of the gospel and needs more power to do it? I do. You know, it's like that Facebook meme, do you need the Holy Ghost to serve God? I need the Holy Ghost to go to Walmart. Especially with all the stuff that's been happening at Walmarts. Oh my goodness, right? He comes to encourage and refresh us when we're weary. Isn't it amazing when we're discouraged and weary that just a moment in His presence can change everything? Right? Or He just comes and says, I'm real, y'all. I'm real. Here's my presence. Let my presence come and reassure you. Have you ever been in a low point? We're in the month of Av where it's the, supposed to be the low point. It's when Israel met, made one of their greatest blunders of all time. 
ever been in a moment where you're like, God, I just need you to show up? God, I just need your presence to reassure me, God, and to let me know that you're present and you really care. And what's one of the greatest things that encourages kids and spouses is when your loved one shows up and they're present. How important is that? How much more when God says, here I am. I'm in your midst. I'm present. Just let me touch you. You know, we need to be people who practice the presence of God, not just corporately. Now, there's something corporately that happens when we come together. But every day, practice the presence of God. When you do your devotional or your time with God, you know what? Just say, Holy Spirit, come. Come, I need you. I ask you to come and minister to me right now. That is so important, you guys. It's so important to be in His presence. Amen. You know, a lot of times people are asking, well, how do I move in the prophetic in this? And how do I get to flow in this gift? And how do I get this? Well, one of the greatest ways is just becoming sensitive to His presence. All of those things flow out of intimacy. They flow out of being with Him, becoming sensitive to His presence, praying in the Spirit. Being in His presence alone. Being in His presence corporately. There are some things that I can just move in and I don't know how I move in other than I've been in His presence. Right? And we need that so desperately. We need His presence and His glory. Hallelujah. So when does the Spirit manifest His presence? I'm going to try to come in for a landing here because we've got to do communion. Well, he often manifests his presence when we ask him to. Do you know God likes to be asked? Do you know he likes to show up where people are hungry for him? It's so simple it messes people up. Right? You know, I've laughed about when God was doing unusual manifestations. Right? Right? And I was at an event one day, and this lady comes up to me, and she goes, tell me about the glory dust. I was like, she made sure no one was around. But he he just started showing up in an unusual way because we wanted him. We wanted him to be present. We honored his presence. We honored his glory. Amen. So, uh, you know... I believe he manifests his presence and glory not only when we ask, but when we expect him to come. Because you know what God responds to? He really responds to obedience. And he also really responds to faith and hunger. Right? Don't you respond to faith and hunger? Amen. Don't you love it? I mean, we love it when we come in to see Nora and we try to argue over who she'll go to, you know. Oh, she loves me more. She loves me more. (laughs) But don't you love it when your kid, your grandkid, your significant other, whatever, that they respond with love to you? We're made in the image of God. He responds to our love. He responds to our faith. He responds to our obedience. And that's when we become a place of His presence. Amen. Knowing God comes by experiencing Him. Yes, by reading His Word. That goes without saying. We need Scripture. But we also need the manifest presence of God. Because I know people that have had a born-again experience. I know people who read the Bible every day. And yet, there's a deficit of his presence. And that shouldn't be. We should be people of his presence. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to be goofy, though we're going to be goofy sometimes when he shows up. That's okay, right? But again, it's what happens when he ministers to you. He empowers you. 
right? He brings healing. He brings encouragement, God. He manifests His glory, amen, when we meet with Him. Hallelujah. So let's just continue to be a people of His presence. It's a foundational thing to us in this place. And may this city become a habitation of His glory. We've had multiple people talk about people driving by on I-35 and recognizing there's a presence of God in this city. That's starting to shift. Because a few years ago it was like, ooh, we ain't stopping there. <laughs> we might get some gas, right? But you know what people are starting to say? There's something different in your city. There's a prosperity in your city. There's a glory in your city that we weren't recognizing before. It's because of the presence and the glory of God that continues to come. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's just stay in this place of loving Him. I'm going to read as we prepare to do communion. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. And I love communion. I love doing this as a remembrance of Him. And I love that communion is a very, very living thing. Right? It's not just a, a dead ritual, but there's life and there's power in it. So I want to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Amen. And he's just been manifesting His presence and His glory all morning. Amen. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, Verse 23, I have handed down to you what came to me by direct revelation from the Lord himself. Isn't that interesting? Paul's like, I had a direct revelation from God himself. The same night in which he was handed over, speaking of Jesus, he took bread and gave thanks. Then he distributed to the disciples and said, Take it and eat your fill. It is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, This cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it, and whatever you drink, and whenever you drink, do this to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story proclaiming our Lord's death until He comes. So, as we take communion today, right, as we, we're, we're retelling what Jesus did, right, that on His body, He took sin, sickness, that through the atonement, all these things of healing, salvation, deliverance, they come to us, amen, we're, we're partaking of His blood that was shed that initiated a new covenant for us. And as I say this every time, this is a table of grace. And we come to Him to partake. If you need forgiveness of sins today, come thanking Him for His blood. If you need healing today, spirit, soul, and body, you come to Him saying, you know, Jesus, thank you. I need this healing. And I come as a celebration of your death, your resurrection. Amen. Because of the power that's in salvation. It is a table of grace that we can approach. And so as we, I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless the elements. Just come, take those. We can have two lines on either side. You can go back to your seat. You can kneel. You can do this at your own pace. Um, and we're going to partake of the Lord's table this morning. So, Lord, today, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you that you came to bring the kingdom, and you came to bring salvation, and we thank you for your blood and your body that was broken and poured out for us. Thank you for the new covenant. Lord, I thank you that we're kingdom people, we're new covenant people, and we just really want to know you. And Lord, I pray that you manifest salvation today. That you manifest your glory today. You manifest your presence. And Father, by faith today, we partake of salvation. Lord, release a salvation in all that means today. 
we partake of it. We partake of forgiveness. We partake of redemption. We partake of healing. We t- partake of, of deliverance. And Father, we thank you today for Jesus. And we bless, ask you to bless this time. Amen. Amen. So just come as we put on some music.